Hello, my name is Douglas Keong. I'm a computer science teacher at Punahou School in Honolulu, Hawaii. And today I'm going to be here to talk a little bit about Microsoft's make code environment that allows us to program these things called microbits, um, which allow you to embed these in fabrics or cardboard or other kinds of maker projects. Really anything tangible, you can kind of bring it to life by working in the make code environment. So, Today I'll show you a bunch of different examples. Um, this language that Microsoft has created is block-based, but it also goes directly to JavaScript, and you can also program these things in JavaScript or even in Python, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, one of the things about MakeCode is you can use the same language to program the microbits, which is primarily what we're going to talk about today, but you can also program Minecraft, which is really kind of a neat development now, so you can make things sort of happen in-game by writing code. So it's, uh, it's some neat stuff. Uh, but let's, uh, let's sort of dive right in. And to support this seminar, I've created a bunch of resources online. And if you go to this tinyurl.com slash microbit workshop, you'll find links to lots of uh, different kinds of projects, things to play with, uh, places where you can buy these things. So you can get all of these things there. And lots more than, you know, more than probably we'll have time to cover here. Um, but I encourage you to go out and explore and find lots of resources to, to learn more about these things. Now, it's just some caveats here. Uh, first of all, I don't work for Microsoft. I don't represent Microsoft. I'm a high school teacher, and I use these in my class all the time. We love them. We use them as a way to introduce computers and computer science, and then we also use them to go a little bit deeper into how you can really start programming uh, some really interesting behaviors and storing data. Um, all kinds of things, and we actually use it as a bridge to text-based programming. But um, I am primarily a high school teacher, and so it's going to be more from, uh, that, from that perspective. Now, most of, the most of the demos today, just in the interest of time, they're going to be in blocks. So we'll primarily be looking at the block-based programming environment. But I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea here uh, in the sense that you can do way more than just working with blocks. And in fact, everything that we do with the blocks here will translate directly over to JavaScript, and um, there will be a lot, lot of other kinds of uh, resources for learning about how to program this in Python and other languages. Um, so if we take a look at the idea of Microsoft MakeCode, now just, just like our own CS50 IDE, one of the advantages to MakeCode is that everything happens in a browser. So um, if you're using this uh, on your own, if you're a high school teacher like me or a middle school teacher, you're using it with students, you can use it right on the web. If you just go to makecode.com, uh, you'll get back to that title screen. And then you can go to this, any, you know, this online editor. And the nice thing about it is you actually have a simulator. So even if you don't have a microbit, you can see immediately what will happen in the simulator. And I'll show you some examples of that live. Um, again, like I said, we use this as a progression from blocks to text. Uh, and I can say, ha having worked with, with many, many students, that I believe that starting with blocks is, is a great way to start beginners to programming because the blocks really get you the main concepts and the main ideas behind programming, iteration, conditionals, functions. But you don't have to worry about syntax. You don't get hung up with the fact that you missed a semicolon or you capitalize something that, a different way. So block-based languages are a, are a great way to start. And even for my students, what we'll find is when we're trying to think through a problem, and remember that programming really is a, is a process of solving problems, um, often when students get stuck, I'll say, well, how would you solve this in blocks? And they'd say, oh, oh I'd, I'd use this block and this block, and oh, OK, I get it now. And they'll know how to kind of, and, and that happens to me as well. So sometimes if you get stuck, think about what the blocks would look like. And uh, the blocks go right over to text. So let's take a look um, again at how this works. Um, again, MakeCode is the block-based environment. MakeCode it also provides a JavaScript tab, so you can tab right over to JavaScript. Uh, there are some things that you can do in JavaScript that you can't do in blocks. And so uh, you can start, if you are working in a block-based project and you get stuck and you're like, I don't see the blocks here that are going to do this. I need to send you know, parameters into a function or something like that. You can actually start writing your own functions and things in JavaScript. And they will show up as a custom block with the JavaScript embedded in the block. So, uh, so don't worry. You can definitely go uh, from blocks to Java and, and back again. Um, there is a great editor called MicroPython. There's an editor called Mu. And um, 
MicroPython, you can also, because we just started programming in Python, so it'll look familiar to you. You can actually create Python-based projects for the microbit. Um, and again, all of those resources are here at tinyurl.com slash microbit workshop. So challenges for today, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you an overview of the microbit hardware. We're going to download and run a few programs and kind of see how they work. I'm going to have you explore about uh, two or three challenges just to give you an idea, give you a taste of some of the different things that you can do with the microbit. And then finally, I'll leave time for some questions and answers. So um, again, you know, I work in a high school, middle school. These are some kinds of projects that students have done. Um, I put this out here, um, not as examples specifically of projects that you would do, but you know, think about when you think about doing a project for CS50, what would happen if the code were not just confined to running on a screen? How could it go outside of that? There are all these different kinds of projects, and what I love about this is it allows you to really bring in your own creativity, and you can make something that you can actually use away from the computer. Um, here's an example of a milk carton robot. You'll notice there's the micro bit, and we're using these crocodile clips to attach them to a servo motor on the inside. And so this kind of opens and closes. Now the micro bit is sensing the light, and that kind of allows you to um, create all kinds of interesting behaviors. Take a look at this one. So this is an air guitar demo. So the micro bit's generating the music, it's great music. And think about what kind of inputs the microbit's taking in. How is it figuring out how to change, how's he changing the music? So if you think about this idea, um, come on in, come on in, uh, to find an empty seat. And, uh, this actually demonstrates a couple of the different inputs on the microbit. So the microbit allows you to, it has a sensor so it can tell which way it's tilted. So, if, so he's tilting the guitar and it's sensing based on the tilt what the angle of rotation is and then it's changing the sound based on the angle of rotation. Now the other thing about the microbit is it actually has a, a light sensor and you have them on your table, you can kind of check them out yourself. But basically these, this is a five by five LED screen and it also senses the light. So if you cover it, it can tell that the light has dimmed. So think about for your projects, what kinds of, what potential that has for you to build in some different behaviors for the microbit based on how much light it detects. Um, so think about the microbit as a way of taking in input. So we talked about rotation, we talked about the light sensor. There are also different outputs. And so here's an example. Um, this one was actually written, um, this is JavaScript, and this actually is going out to what's called a NeoPixel strip. And a NeoPixel strip is a plastic strip that has these embedded RGB LEDs in them. And so you can, he basically created bike lights with this. Oops. Let me see if I get that to play. There we go. So he actually has the microbit mounted to the, hand, to the frame of his bike, and the NeoPixel strips are are pretty tough and they're weather resistant and he just kind of st stuck them along the side of the bike and so you can create custom lighting displays using the micro bit using code essentially. So it's very, it's very cool. Um, what I love about the micro bit is because it's so small and lightweight you can embed it into things like wearables. So this is an activity we did with young kids but you could certainly adapt this uh, into fabrics for example. So we, we give a picture frame and we just put out two strips of duct tape and you stick the micro bit onto the duct tape and then you cut, the, fr cut the, uh, the tape off of the frame. And basically, you can use Velcro tabs and you can actually create a wristband for the micro bit. So I had a student who was a, um, he was a pitcher, baseball pitcher, and he actually programmed the micro bit to be a pitch counter. So as many times as he threw pitches in a session, every time it detected the acceleration of his arm, it counted that as one pitch. And so after throwing you know, a bunch of times in a session, he could come back and it would actually show how many pitches he'd thrown. So kind of neat. So if you think about it, you know, think about all the possibilities 
that um, watch-based technologies give us in terms of collecting data, storing data, and then displaying the data or displaying the values of things that it's measured. Those are, when, when I think about that, I start thinking about some really neat possibilities with using the microbits. Um, I was out in San Mateo at the Maker Fair, and they actually had a wearable fashion show. And so this is a dress that she made, and she embedded lights. Now you can do this, I don't know if she used a microbit, but she used a microprocessor like the microbit to talk to embedded sewn-in pieces of uh, light, essentially, light strips. So if you, are, uh, um, if you work with clothing or fabrics, textiles, uh, think about how might you sew in uh, some different kinds of circuits and use the microbit to control them. I think that would be a really interesting project. Here are some other examples. And they use this, uh, you know, there are a lot of maker spaces around here that will allow you to use things like laser cutters. So she actually laser cut a beautiful design into the, into the dress. Um, this really helps to combine things that you love with computing and with programming. Um, this is another thing that was kind of cool. So this was a fashion show that was put on by and for um, models who um, are amputees. So these models are double amputees, but they've actually got these legs that are programmed with different designs and patterns based on their movements. And so there's this whole fashion show. And so, you know, I, I love this idea of let's take assistive technologies and make them something that's visually appealing and make it something that's actually kind of interesting and cool to look at as well. Um, and again, if you're going to do something like this, you need a microprocessor. You need some kind of a brain. So these things are like 16 bucks. Um, we have a few of them here. So if you're interested in using this for a project, um, come talk to me. Let me know. We can support you. We've got these. You can borrow these um, and uh, use them for the duration of your project. And then if you wanted to purchase it, there's links there to purchase them. They're not, they're not that expensive. Um, the hardware itself, remember if, I, if we go back to week zero when we talked about a computer, if you think about a computer as basically a CPU or a processor, that brings in inputs and outputs it in some way. The microbit, same thing. The microbit basically has a number of inputs. And if you look on this diagram, you can see some of the different inputs. Um, we talked a little bit before about there's an accelerometer. There's actually a compass. So it can detect which way it's being turned. So you can take it and you can actually turn it. And it will detect what direction it's facing, which is kind of interesting. It has an accelerometer. So it can detect how it's been shaken or moved. Um, it basically uh, it has a light sensor as well. It also, of course, has conventional input. There are buttons. So there's the A button, the B button, and the A and B button together. And if you press both of those together, you can actually um, get a third behavior there. And um, you have digital and analog outputs here, um, as well as inputs. And you have a micro USB connector, and that connects it to the computer so that you can actually program it. So um, some different accessories that we use with it. So we'll use crocodile clips that are very easy to connect to different things like servo motors or lights or pretty much anything that will work with uh, something like an Arduino, for example. Like those kinds of accessories, you can, you can plug them in on these. Um, they, this basically comes with the battery pack and the USB cable with it. The battery pack allows you to use it separately from the computer. When you have it plugged into your computer, it's powered off the USB. Um, if you have a pair of earbuds, you can actually use the crocodile clips to connect the earbuds to the microbit. So you can actually hear, it has a tone generator. So you can actually create music. Um, I've had students create the entire Legend of Zelda theme off of the microbit. <laughs> so, um, and if you think back to some of the problem sets we've, we've had that dealt with music, you know, there might be interesting things that you can do with scales or other kinds of things. Um, there's lots of maker kits. So you can either get, you can get the bare bones package or you can get it as a kit, with, which will come with like a bunch of other stuff that you can play around with. So um, some cool stuff. But let's, let's try working with them right now. If you want to go ahead and pull out, if you have a laptop, just uh, if you pull out a laptop and you go to makecode.com, there is a link to microbit, and you'll see it on the left. 
if you just click the, the micro bit, it'll open it up in a browser. Um, and I'll just sort of walk you through, and you know, I've, I basically passed out these micro bits because I want you to kind of have a chance to play around with them. Um, later on at home, if you want to play with the simulator, pretty much anything you can program here, you'll see on the simulator. And you can even simulate holding it in different ways and shaking it and those kinds of things. But I actually like working with the actual physical micro bits, or at least while you're here, um, work with the micro bit and um, try it out in real life. <laughs> so uh, this is what the interface actually looks like. All the projects are stored locally. So on your computer, they're stored on your computer itself. So they're not cloud-based at all. So um, anytime you, so you don't need to sign in. Um, as long as you're using the same computer, whenever you click on projects, you'll see all the projects that you've had, um, that you've um, been working on. Um, you can program in either blocks or JavaScript. And as I said earlier, we'll primarily stay in blocks. But if you're ever curious, and if you want to just click JavaScript, you'll see what all the equivalent of it looks in JavaScript. And if you wanted to, you could just program it in JavaScript directly if you wanted. Um, I usually start with blocks. Um, this is what we call the block toolbox. So these are all the drawers. This is very much like Scratch. So you'll have lots of different drawers with different kinds of inputs, um, different kinds of blocks here. You drag the blocks into the coding workspace. That's where you're going to build your program. Um, you can actually download the program directly as a file. And that's what you'll drag onto your micro bit. So when you plug the micro bit in, and you can go ahead and plug the micro bit in now um, if you like. Just plug it right into your USB port. Um, it'll show up like a volume. It'll show up like a hard drive, basically. And the way that you load programs onto it is you just drag that program right onto the micro bit itself. Um, yeah, so this is it. So you can play around with it. You'll see what the simulator looks like. Uh, so let's start with programming and animation. So if you go ahead and open the basic toolbox drawer, you can drag two of these show LED blocks onto your workspace. And then you can position them underneath the forever block to look kind of just like that. You'll notice there's a few other things, too. While you're doing that, I'll just keep talking. But you can, you can actually not just show LEDs, but there are actually patterns. So there are pre-built programs that are built in so you can make it look like you know, there's a heart shape. There's other kinds of things. You can show LEDs here. You can also show numbers. And this is actually very valuable because I use this to show the values of variables. So I've been working with variables, or if I'd like to display what the current reading is off of a sensor, you can just drag that block right in here, and then you can actually see what that sensor readout is. And when you say show number, it will display it directly to the screen of the micro bit. Or if it's a long number, it'll scroll it across the screen. So um, once you've moved these in, you, know, you can try showing some of these different things. Um, you'll notice that the animation will show up in the simulator on the, left -hand, on the upper left-hand side of your screen. And you can even try um, the show icon block, which is what I was talking about, where you've got these built-in, you have built-in uh, designs. Um, you can experiment with different kinds of animations, all kinds of cool things. And then I'm going to go over to downloading the program to the micro bit. So once you have that, just this is what you would essentially do. You're going to plug the micro bit in with the USB cable. If you click the download button, it actually saves it onto your hard drive. If you're using Microsoft Edge, you can choose Save As. And that will save it onto your micro bit hard drive. So the download button looks like that. Save As will look like that. It'll go, you can save it directly onto the micro bit volume, which will come up kind of like, it'll look just sort of like that micro bit volume there. With Google Chrome, you can go to your Downloads folder, and you can just drag copy it. You don't need to worry about managing the files on the micro bit. It only holds one at a time anyway. So you drag it over there. It'll just replace what's there. And then it'll show up actually on the micro bit itself, which is kind of cool. So I think the goal is to primarily get you to the point where you can download a file to your hard drive, and then put it onto the micro bit so that it actually runs on the micro bit. That would be the goal, ideally. Um, get to that point, and then anything that you create in the project's um, coding workspace, you can then, you'll know how to move it onto your micro bit itself. Now, one of the other things to notice is there's lots of other different things. So you can say on button A press. So you could make it, when you press button A, display one thing. But when you press button B, have it have it display something else. And so that's, you know, that's kind of neat to do as well. Um, 
let me let me actually go over to I'm going to switch over to the make code environment itself and we'll kind of play around a little bit with this So you'll notice that in the loops, you basically have a forever loop, which just runs, you know, as soon as the program starts, it just runs forever. It's like a while true. Uh, you also have on start, which will run just once. And I usually use this to initialize uh, variables and things like that that I just want to have happen once. Um, these inputs, these are essentially event handlers, which just sit there and wait. They listen. They're, it's a listener for, you know, if button A is pressed, then we're going to display something specific. So for instance, maybe we show a hard icon when button A is pressed. Um, the other thing that's cool is if you highlight this, if you click on it, you click copy and paste, you can paste in another one. This one's grayed out because you can't have two events that happen when the same button is pressed, but I can use this to change it over to button B, and I can say let's choose something like a house when that's pressed. So you can create different kinds of event handlers that way. Um, another thing that you can do is when you're done with these, if you click on share, if you click the share button, you can actually publish the project. And when you publish the project, it actually shares it using a URL. So that URL is essentially the program that I've just created. So if I open up another thing in my browser and I just go to, you'll notice that it shows up here. And if you go to the JavaScript, you can actually see what the JavaScript looks like. So this is an on button pressed, and then you've got essentially the action underneath. So this is the event, and then this is the uh, resulting action from that event. Um, you can take this and you can download it and then you can drag copy that file directly onto your micro bit so you can try out somebody else's code. The other thing that you can do is you can basically copy all of that text, go back to your make code. Well, this won't make sense because I, uh, I'm, this is the same program. But if you created a new project, for example, and let's say somebody else wrote that, you can go over to JavaScript and just paste in that code. And now if you go back to blocks, it's all there. So you can easily kind of remix other projects. You can share projects. Um, and uh, the other thing that projects will do is if you have any hex file that you've actually downloaded, you can actually import the file, and that will open it and bring it into your computer. So for the next challenge, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you kind of take a look at this one broken program that I created. <laughs> so if we go over to. Uh, it's basically sh um, shoutkey.com slash lychee. And this is a temporary, this is a temporary uh, link. So this, this won't work after the fact. But all of these are linked from the actual resources sheet that um, is at the beginning of this um, presentation. But for today, anyway, if you go to this URL, um, it's just a quick URL that's going to bring you up to the board game arrow. If you're watching this later, if you're not watching this live, go back to tinyurl.com slash microbitworkshop, and you'll see a link, board game arrow, challenge one, there. And that's actually the make code link. That's the permanent link. Um, but if you go to shoutkey.com slash lychee, you'll come up with a program that I just shared that here's, I'll show you what I want to do with it. You know, you ever played those board games where you have the spinner and you kind of spin the spinner? Essentially, what I want to have happen here is I want to have it so when you shake it, it spins automatically. And um, when it spins, one of the neat things when you share a project is you'll actually see it running in the simulator. So this is what it's supposed to look like. If I click shake, the spinner spins. And you see how it slows down? Just like a regular spinner, at some point it'll stop. And where the arrow stops, then that's maybe the direction that you move if you have a board game where you can move in one of four directions. And then somebody else can shake it, and it'll spin again, and then it'll slow down, and it'll stop. So that's the idea behind it. 
So here's a programming, kind of what I think of as a little programming puzzle to figure out. So here's how it actually works. So I've created some variables here. I've created a variable called delay. And when I shake it, it's going to clear anything that's currently on the screen. It's going to set the delay to 0. And then we have a while loop. So while delay is less than 500, we're going to show the left arrow. We're going to pause delay amount of times. And delay is the amount of milliseconds. And then it's going to show the next frame of, this, of the arrow. And it's going to pause for some number of milliseconds, delay amount of milliseconds. And then after it shows all four of these, we're going to change delay by 150. And that basically means delay equals delay plus 150. So delay starts at 0, so it's, there's pretty much no delay first time around. Then it's 150 milliseconds between frames. And then it's 300, and then it's 450. And then when it becomes 600, this is no longer true. As soon as delay becomes 600, this isn't true anymore, and show, so it should just stop. And because we haven't issued a clear screen, it's going to show essentially the down arrow. And that's where the problem is. I implemented this delay so that it, it starts fast and it kind of slows down, but it always shows the down arrow. So you're always going to be moving down. So that's kind of the problem. <laughs> so this is just one of those problems that you run into with programming and you know it's sort of like okay I had this idea how can I change this so that the arrow points in a random direction because what I'd like to have it do is I want it to basically decay I want it to start at zero and then slow down slow down slow down slow down at some point when it slows down after a certain threshold then I want it to stop spinning the arrow and I want the arrow to just stop wherever it is so as soon as it passes that threshold I want it to stop on whatever frame the arrow is currently at so think about how could we modify this code? How can we modify this program so that the arrow always lands in the same place? So take about five minutes, talk with people at your table, figure this out, and we'll, we'll come back again and we'll kind of think about how that might work. And meanwhile, while you're doing that, let me go ahead and I'm going to go through the process of downloading this and importing it into make code so that you can see what's happening. So. Um, you can talk amongst yourselves, but I'm going to talk as well. So, um, so I'm going to download this first, and that's going to go into my downloads folder. And then back here in make code, in my IDE, I'm going to go over to projects, and I'm going to choose import file. And this will allow me to actually choose it from my downloads. And this is a board game arrow that just came over, so I'm going to choose open. And then I'm going to choose Go Ahead. And what that will do, remember that that's a file that I downloaded from the shared project. And you can import a hex file directly into MakeCode. And so now we have actually these arrows. So any ideas to start out with about how we might get this to work properly? I mean, one of the things, when I play board games, the reason the arrow doesn't, you know, if you were playing against a robot and the robot could flick the arrow with exactly the same power every single time, it would always land at the same place every single time. Um, so that wouldn't be much fun. So I think that what makes the, the board game spinner kind of interesting is that humans are always going to flick the arrow with diff slightly different amounts of force. And if you assume that the decay, it decays at the same rate, then the amount of force, in other words, maybe where it starts, changes. So suppose we flipped it and we said, while well, decay is greater than zero. But where it starts is some random number between like 600 and 800, something like that. And we could, we could try that. Um, and the, it's easy enough to do it here if you just say, you can change this. A second, let me pull this away here.
That's kind of funny. I don't know if the blocks are like the blocks are like stuck. Let me uh, let me try copying this, and let me go over and start a new project. I'm just out of curiosity. I'm going to flick back into JavaScript, and this is actually what it looks like in JavaScript, which is kind of neat. All of this stuff here, and then it should change it over to blocks directly. Um, and now we can separate them. Um, this let's change this over to greater than, and we'll make it zero. So while it's greater than zero, we're going to continue to do something. And then let's change the delay. This time, if we want to change it going back the other way, if we want the same rate of decay, we could just basically set that to be negative. So now we're going backwards. So what we've just done by changing two things is we've gone backwards. Now we're, we're basically running the thing. We're starting delay at some big number, like, you know, I don't know. Um, 500. And then we'll actually run it. And notice that as soon as I make the change, it'll get reflected up here. So let's go ahead and try this out. OK. <laughs> it still stops <laughs> down, right? Um, the other thing, too, is I just realized because we're pausing the, by delay, it reverses it, right? So it starts out really slow, and it gets faster and faster and faster, and then it stops, which doesn't really duplicate how a real arrow would work. So maybe what we would have to do is do a mathematical calculation based on delay. And so what I can do here is I can take this, and I can say, OK, don't pause delay amount of times. Let's pause. Whatever we started at, 500 minus delay. I'm just guessing. Let's see if this works. We'll copy it and paste it. But you know, again, part of the fun of programming, I think, is just being able to think through some of these problems and just try different things out. And I think make code makes it really easy to just experiment and try some of these things out for yourself. Um, you know, let me just do as a test two frames. And let's just see if this has that effect of slowing it down. Oh, wait. Notice where I put the delay. Put it in the wrong place. Let's put it inside the while loop. Let's try that. Oh, it slows down. There we go. Now, one of the things, too, is ideally um, you can also set a variable so that you don't have this hard-coded number of 500. Like, we could set it to max. We could say, let's create a variable. Let's call it max, or in this case, the, Mako gives you some freebies. We can rename this, and we'll just rename that to max. And one of the cool things about it is if you rename it here, if you rename a variable, it refactors all your code, and it changes everywhere, which is awesome. So um, you know what? Let's set max to um, some value like, um, like say, 400. And let's implement something random. And one of the things that I love in MakeCode is if you go over to math and you choose pick random, you'll pick a random number. So let's say 0 to 4 um, times 25. And so that will be either 0 or 100. Well, let's, let's make it times 50. So we'll say. We'll multiply this times 50. Now notice what I'm doing is I'm just pulling these blocks out of different drawers. So I'm pulling this out of the math drawer. Um, we don't want to just say 0 to 4 because it's going to be like 401, 402, 403, 404, which you're not going to see any difference. We want big changes. So that's why we're putting in a multiplier of 50. We're setting our max to that. And this can now replace. It's not going to replace it. What we are going to do is grab max. Max is going to replace 500. Um, and similarly, we would want to drag it into these other places too. So grab max. There we go. And now we should have more randomness, which is great. Um, the same problem as you've probably seen 
will still happen, right? Because it's still going to end up ultimately, even though we've got this while loop, it's checking the while loop, it's got to execute everything in the while loop until it gets to the end. And the last frame at the end of the while loop is still a down arrow. So the game is still rigged, folks. You're still going to always get the down arrow. Um, so there are some other ideas that you might have for fixing this. You know, sometimes people are like, well, geez, maybe we, we need to separate this out or have a separate if statement. There are if statements in the logic. Um, you know, check each time. So before you display each one of these, check to see if the delay is greater than zero. And maybe increment it a little bit each time, break it out. But in the end, the way to solve this problem is probably going to be breaking it out of the while loop entirely and using a different kind of structure. Um, but I'm hoping, just to give you a sense for the, the complexity of how you go about solving some of these problems, and we're still in block land here, right? We're still working with blocks. If you go over to JavaScript, you can actually work in JavaScript. In fact, some of the things that you start doing is you'll notice here, this is where our math, this is where our math random function is. And this actually makes a call to the math library, it calls random, and then you, know, you can actually change stuff directly here. So if I wanted to add plus to that, I could basically just do this at plus one. And then if you go back to blocks, it actually goes into the math drawer for you and pulls out the plus and puts it in there. So there's, you can easily go back and forth between JavaScript and blocks. And at some point in your projects, you may end up wanting to just kind of stay in JavaScript. Okay. Let's show you something else. So, um, so some of the things that you can do with input are kind of cool. So I'm going to start a new project. And actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go over to um, some of these projects here that are already given to you. And this is a nice way to learn. Um, lots of different projects here, and you can see the JavaScript for all of these. Some of these I think you can probably only do in JavaScript. Um, but a lot of them are the blocks. Some of the more advanced ones, like Infection, which I'm hoping we'll have a chance to take a look at, um, they're done in JavaScript primarily. We're going to look at Servo Calibrator. And this is what this actually looks like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to download Servo Calibrator. And I'm going to actually move it onto my, I actually have a servo hooked up. Let's see here. And the servos are pretty cheap. You can purchase these. I purchased mine from Amazon. I think they were like three or four dollars each. They're not expensive. I actually got a block. I got a whole bunch of servos actually for my students. I got like a whole box of them. Um, and they're awesome for experimenting with. So I'm going to actually move this downloaded program onto the micro bit. Just plug this in so it should show up. And if I go over to downloads, I'm going to grab the micro bit servo calibrator and I'm going to drag it over to micro bit. And this copies it on to the actual micro bit itself. And you'll notice that on the micro bit, you'll see a little yellow light that's flashing. And so we've just copied that on. And I've got a little servo motor here with a little arrow with a little, with a little high sign. And if you, press, if you press these buttons, you can actually move the servo back and forth, which is kind of neat. But what I was thinking of is I wanted to come up with a project where when you use the rotation sensor on it, so when you turn this thing, it actually reads it and makes this servo motor react. So let's try that out. So what I'm going to do is instead of saying forever show number, what I'm going to do is forever, um, I'm going to copy some of the stuff here. So this right pin, write it to angle. I'm going to copy that, and I'm just going to paste this in. Pin 0 is the servo. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to input, and I'm going to choose rotation or pitch. And you'll notice that if you hover over this, this will tell you what it says. It'll tell you what it does. <laughs> it says it's disabled. Let me plug this in here, and maybe it'll tell me what you do. 
This is the pitch or roll of the device or the rotation along the x-axis or the y-axis in degrees. So you can change it um, by choosing this either pitch or roll. I think, um, yeah, pitch or roll. So um, let's go ahead and download this. And we'll go back. Version 5 here. And I see the yellow light. It's going over to it. Okay. Wow. It's, it's, it's all the way at the end. So I'm turning it. And I can feel the servo kind of wanting to move. So I think it's detecting the rotation, but it's not, it's not moving. So for a troubleshooting thing, what are some things that we might want to know? If, how do we figure this out? It's just like a programming problem now, but it's connected to hardware a little bit too. What are some reasons maybe why this thing might not be <laughs> doing what we want it to do? It's like humming a little bit. <laughs> might have something to do with the range. Yeah, do we know what the range is for the servo? You'll notice here, if you look at this, this basically changes by 5. So max is 0 and 5. And it goes to 180. So maybe it goes from 180 to 0. But we don't know where 0 is in the range of motion. The servo goes back and forth. 0 could be here, right? Um, it's 180 degrees of motion, right? So it could be 0 could be here going to 180, and we're all looking at positive numbers. Or 0 could be here, and it could be negative 90, positive 90. All we know is that it's 180 degrees. So how might we go about figuring that problem out? Like, how do we know what it's saying? Let's try this. We'll go to forever. And we'll put in show number, but in this time, this time instead of showing the angle, we'll just go ahead and show the rotation. And so now, whatever the rotation is at, this thing will show us. And one of the nice things about the simulator, you don't need a micro bit to try this out. You can actually test what this thing is doing by using the simulator itself. So it looks like negative 50, negative 5042. Wow, that's a whole stream of numbers. Well, let's try it out on the actual thing. Let me go ahead and send this thing over to the micro bit, and we'll actually try it on the real thing. All right. Um, where are you, micro bit? There it is. Right down there. So that little bit of an experiment might help us kind of craft a different kind of project. So if we go over to um, the servo calibrator here, um, let me go over to this one. OK. So this one, we actually set the angle to 90, and then we write it to, oops, sorry. So now, if we set the rotation and we add 90 to it, then we should end up with the right values here that we've kind of determined experimentally from working with it. So let me go ahead and download it. I'll kind of drag this over here. And then for this, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to detach it from here because I'm going to actually use the actual um, battery pack so that I can hold this mobile. And you'll notice that now that I've got the rotation, and you were right, it was the range. It was related to the range. When you get the range working, well, now I could put this in my hand, 
and then get this thing. Oh, did I just dislodge these things? I think I dislodged the crocodile clips. And get it to move fairly accurately this way. So now imagine that you had these things separated and you had this wired up so the wires were hidden. You could actually work out some kind of a game where, you know, you could even have something that was wrist mounted that telegraphed the motion somewhere else. Um, so there's just some interesting ideas that that might give you for games. And this actually, this is a cheap servo motor. I have some servo motors you can use. Um, I went to Starbucks and I had a little coffee stirrer. <laughs> and I'm using some tape. Um, so what I love about maker projects is, you know, they, they can be low budget. And they can be simple, cheap, easy prototypes. And that's really the best way to learn is just create lots of prototypes and work with them. So if you're interested in a project that has some tangible element to it, that has you actually working with real stuff in addition to doing the coding, but the coding is really to make the real stuff work, that's where the micro bit, I think, can really come in handy. Now, there's one aspect of this that we haven't talked about yet. This actually has a radio transmitter, communicates via Bluetooth. And so if you have other micro bits, you can actually communicate wirelessly. So I could put this micro bit somewhere else and have something on this end that was sending information about the rotation angle as a variable invisibly to another servo. So you could actually make a motion or make something happen or make lights happen across the room using Bluetooth, using the radio blocks in MakeCode. And the radio blocks are all right here. And so just as an example, so this was the servo, and we found out what the maximum and minimum values were for rotation on the x-axis. Um, but you can create a radio simulation that basically looks like this. So you would work with different partners and these are just some of the radio blocks that you can use. So radio set group one, what that does is it establishes a group number. And so any micro bit that has that group number will be able to communicate with another micro bit that has that group, the same group number. And so I would have you pair up or pair up by table or you know, work by table. And as long as your group all has the same number, you can communicate with each other and you won't interfere with other people's. So you can decide what this number is. You can set that ahead of time. Then when you press A, if you just use radio send string, you can actually send a string. So I'm from Hawaii. Uh, when we say hello to people, sometimes we say aloha. And you could send that string, aloha. Um, when you receive the string on the other end, you can show the string. In other words, remember, this is like the say block. So this will actually show the string that it was received. And if what you received, you can check the value of it. If it's the same as that string, you can then send the string mahalo, which means thank you. So um, you can try that as a quick little project. If you have two micro bits, is try sending aloha and try receiving mahalo. Um, and this is a great, this is a fun activity. My wife, Mary Keong, who um, works with sixth grade at Punahou, she does, she came up with this idea. She works with her kids with that. And then she has her students try to come up with different kinds of scenarios for what kind of data could you send and receive. Um, and even for you, I would encourage you to think about, um, play around with the, micro, with the microbit radio block and think about what is it that I can send and receive. And if you wanted to experiment with JavaScript and start working with some more advanced structures, think about, you know, we've done a lot of work this semester with storing strings and parsing strings in different ways. You have text blocks that you can work with and make code that will parse the strings in different ways and conjugate them and do other kinds of things. So could you create some kind of a semi-intelligent communicator that actually either uses a, you know, what if it was something like a sign language translator or something that managed to work with a servo or take the, the content of a text string and communicate over to the servo? Um, for the purposes of this independent project, you're probably going to want to dive into JavaScript and start working with some different functions. Um, you can, you know, send in receive, um, you know, you can uh, return values like tuples and things like that um, using MicroPython if you wanted to. Uh, so you can actually, you can create structs and enums. So you, there's a lot more that you can do with the language aside from the blocks. So if you wanted to push this further, you could definitely do a project that would be a good project that, you know, would use a lot of these things. So again, come talk to me. Let me know if it's something that you're interested in. Um, last thing is there is actually a, uh, in, this is a really cool activity. I'm just going to kind of show it. Um, 
I don't think we have time to run it as a group today, but what's really neat about it is there is a project. Um, so my wife and I actually wrote a curriculum. It's a maker curriculum using the, using the microbit. It's free. It's on Microsoft's site, and I've linked to it in, in the, uh, the resources. But one of the programmers over at Microsoft, uh, my buddy Pelly, he actually created this infection simulation. And what's really neat is we actually can use this to talk about how diseases spread in a community. And so the idea behind it is everybody has a microbit. And one of the microbits, unbeknownst to everybody else, has a virus on it. And that's patient zero. And so what will happen is you can go up and you can meet people by holding your microbit close to somebody. And when you're close enough, the microbits will actually exchange information. And it's like they've, they've met. And there's a phase of the game where you go around and you meet as many people as you can. But the disease actually has an incubation period. So after a certain amount of time, uh, they're, they're going to start beeping. And as they start beeping, um, what you'll notice is um, different people are going to get sick based on the order that they met other people. And so it becomes sort of this uh, inference deduction activity to try to figure out who got who was sick first. <laughs> and so that's, and then you can talk about things like quarantining. So, you know, like some people decide, well, I'm just going to sit at my own table and I'm not going to meet anybody else. We're just going to meet ourselves and then we'll stay healthy. And sometimes that works. Um, one time I did this with a group and two people decided, they said, don't come near us. We're going to stay separate. We're not going to get sick. We're going to let everybody else get sick and then we're going to be the last one standing. And what happened is after about five minutes, both of them got sick and <laughs> both of them expired. And the whole rest of the world was saved because just as luck would have had it, had it, one of them actually was patient zero. And by deciding to isolate themselves um, unknowingly, they basically quarantined themselves and saved the world. So um, lots of different kinds of things that you can talk about like within the context of a science class working with this. Um, but it's a fun, fun activity. Uh, this had to have been done in, um, in JavaScript. So for this, let's see where the... Uh, code itself is, uh, oh, here it is. So again, similarly, you would go to the actual page here, and you can find this. I linked to this. Um, you can also go to the microbit, the micro, the make code uh, website, and you'll see this. Um, but if you, you know, again, I love the microbit, and I love make code because it makes it so easy to get into the programming of it. But I don't want you to, you know, it's, I think it's misleading how simple it is. You can actually get involved at a level of complexity with this that is, you know, pretty advanced. And there's so much that you can do with it. It's such a, you know, JavaScript's a powerful language. And Microbit is a, is a great little platform. And so you can do quite a lot with it. And you can really, I would encourage you to push the hardware as far as you can. Learn as much as you can about it. And think about what kind of activity can I come up with that uses either tangible um, materials or involves other people working with it. And, um, and then definitely share out what you do, because there's a growing community of microbit enthusiasts. And um, a lot of, I've got a lot of friends on the, on the make code team who are working really hard on this. They're doing, they're, but they're really curious to see what are some other things that people come up with. And so um, if you have questions or if you need resources, you know, I will certainly see what I can do to, uh, to help support you on that. So um, with that, I'm going to officially wrap up. And thank you for coming to this seminar and for being here. But I'll stay around at the end to answer questions. And if you want to play around with some of the servos and things like that, uh, certainly feel free to do so. So again, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you on campus. Thanks a lot.